Hello, my name is David Foster. I'm one of the elders here at Rockwall Press. And for the next several weeks, I'll be leading us in a study of the attributes of God, uh, who he is, what he is like, what, what the scriptures tell us about him. The Westminster Confession of Faith uh, poses this question. What is the chief end of man or what is his purpose? And the answer in that catechism is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. In order to do that, we've got to know who he is, uh, what he's really like. J.I. Packer uh, made this comment. We are modern men and modern men as a rule cherish great thoughts of men but small thoughts of God. Years ago, another man, J.B. Phillips, penned this book, Your God is Too Small, in which he talks about various misconceptions of God. Uh, God the policeman, God the heavenly uh, killer of joy, uh, God in so many different manifestations, distortions, that, that we often entertain. What are great Christians, what have they said through the centuries about knowing God and its importance? Um, well, Blaise Pascal, the great uh, philosopher, made this comment. It is the pathetic fate of deity to be everlastingly misunderstood. We often, again, have distortions or mis misconceptions of who God is. The Bible says God made man in his image and now man has returned the favor, said Voltaire. We've molded him, shaped him according to our limited understanding of life. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, though, counters that with this statement. Nothing will so enlarge the intellect, nothing so magnify the whole soul of man as a devout, earnest, continual investigation of the great subject of deity. A.W. Pink, another great biblical scholar, said a spiritual and saving knowledge of God is the greatest need of every human creature. A.W. Tozer, a great devotional writer, penned a book called The Knowledge of the Holy, uh, which is a wonderful uh, devotional book on the attributes of God, made this comment. What comes to our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. J.I. Packer again. Disregard the study of God and you sentence yourself to stumble and blunder through life blindfold, as it were, with no sense of direction and no understanding of what surrounds you. So all these great men uh, acknowledge that the most important thing we can pursue in this life is knowing God not just knowing about him, you can accumulate multiple theological degrees, you can study Greek and Hebrew and the scripture and still be far removed from God. I think of Moody's statement years ago, he said, uh, just because there's, you know, you, you can't just be a Christian just because you know something. Uh, being in a garage, Moody said, doesn't make you any more of a car than, than being uh, knowing about God makes you a Christian. We've got to know him personally and accurately in order to worship him appropriately. What or who, whom we worship determines our behavior. Andrew John Murray said, we need God. We need Him. Uh, I've spent over 40 years in pastoral 
and counseling ministry, and I'm going to make a bold statement. It has many layers to it, but it's this. A proper application of the attributes of God will solve every problem known to the human race. That doesn't mean that there aren't difficulties along the path, but an application of what we know about God as believers to our lives comforts us, strengthens us, equips us for every good work. That's what Scripture tells us. And what does Scripture say about knowing God? There are several biblical statements uh, that we could go to, but I picked a few. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom or the strong man of his strength or the rich man of his riches, but let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for in these I delight. Hebrews eleven six, And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. We need the passionate pursuit of God exemplified by David in Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? David's heart des heart's desire was to pursue God, to know him, and that's why Scripture uh, refers to him as a man after God's own heart. He was seeking God with all he was. Now here's the problem. There are obstacles in the way of getting to know God. There are hurdles we have to overcome in order to reach uh, him, knowing him. And the obstacles are at least these three. Number one, sin. We're all sinners. We are all prone to wander, as the hymnist uh, says. Uh, ever since the fall of man, ever since the Garden of Eden, our tendency has been to sin and hide from God, uh, to try to avoid Him when we're living actively in sin. We don't want to hear about God. We don't want to know him accurately. We want to assume that he doesn't exist or that he's some other kind of God than the one the scriptures portray him uh, to be. So sin gets in the way. It's an obstacle. It's an obstruction to knowing God. So we need to go before God and say, Lord, please cleanse my heart. Please give me the desire expressed by David uh, to pant after you, to seek you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. A second obstacle, though, to knowing God is our intellect. I mean, we're, we're all limited in some respect that way. God, in a sense, is incomprehensible. We cannot know all about him. Uh, but we can know truth about him. We don't have exhaustive knowledge of God given to us in Scripture, but we have accurate knowledge of God that we can obtain. We have enough uh, in Scripture to equip us to live the Christian life. But our intellects are limited, and therefore, born out of that, often are misconceptions of God. Romans 11.33 puts it this way. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. 
He's bigger than us. He's so much bigger than us that we can't begin to comprehend fully who he is. But thank God, he has given us a revelation of himself in this book so that we have enough knowledge of him to be able to live life well. A third obstacle we face in getting to know God is it is a matter of faith, not sight. I cannot reach out and touch God. I can't grasp Him. Walking the, through the Christian life is not one is not built on the assumption that I can reach out and touch God. It's a matter of faith. It's a matter of belief based upon the scriptures, what they tell us about who God is. J.I. Packer made this comment regarding all of this, sin, intellect, faith, not sight, and so forth. He says, because we are limited and weak, sometimes we imagine at some point God is too. Now that's a faulty assumption, isn't it? But it is one we have to wrestle with because we ourselves are limited and weak. We imagine at some point God must be too, but he is not. How do we get to know him then? If we've got all these obstacles in, this, in the way, if there are all these misconceptions abounding about God, how do we grasp, how do we pull together accurate knowledge about who he is? Where do we go? Well, we go to the scriptures for sure, because the scriptures, uh, another term for scripture would be basically revelation. It's the writings that reveal who God is from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation unfolding before us is the majesty of God, his attributes, his character, his ways of operating in this world. So the means to understanding who God is, how we get to know him, has to do with understanding and spending time delving into scripture, really reading the Bible, not with a jaundiced view, not with preconceptions, but letting scripture speak to us to tell us exactly who God is. You know, it's easy. I've, I've been a Christian since 1967, and here we sit at 2020. And, you know, at times along the way, I faced many M-I-N-I crises uh, of faith along the way. And, you know, I've sometimes I've gotten so wrapped up in church activity that or theological training or whatever. I've had sin in my life that's gotten me off track and away from pursuing God for himself, himself alone. And so I need the scriptures to redirect me. I need the Holy Spirit to reveal to me in the scriptures what they say about who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the scriptures are foundational. God is revealing himself to us through the written word. He's telling us about himself. Secondly, and I touched on this just a moment ago, we need a teacher outside of ourselves who has the grasp of who God is, and that's the Holy Spirit because he is God. He is, according to Scripture, the revealer of truth. He's our teacher. He's our comforter and counselor. He's our guide in this Christian life. And so we pray, God, reveal yourself to me in your word. Help me understand it by means of your Holy Spirit. But God is good. He's given us revelation of himself in Christ. 
so we can look at the life of Christ uh, and see who God is. Uh, Book of Hebrews says that he is the exact representation of God. So if you want to know who God is, look at Christ. Look at the Holy Spirit. Uh, Look at the Father in Scripture. Uh, So we have the Holy Spirit, we have the Scriptures, but we also have some degree of revelation of who God is, even in nature. Psalm 8, Psalm 19, Romans chapter 1, tell us that there is some reflection of God, even in nature, so that when you look at a flower, and you see the complexity of a flower or the complexity of a human being, how they're formed, how they're born, how they are, uh, how they function. Uh, When you see a great artwork, when you see trees and leaves, there's something about God in a sense reflected in those things. His artistry, his creativity, his power, Uh, is evident in nature, Scripture says. So we have the Holy Spirit, we have Scripture, we have nature, we have the person of Christ uh, to tell us a little bit about who God is. Not complete knowledge again, but true knowledge, accurate knowledge of who He is. So over the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at several of Uh, what are termed attributes of God in this study. And I'll just quickly hit on several of them, just highlight them, and then we're going to come back to those attributes in depth, uh, looking at them and talking about what Scripture does tell us about who God is. God is love, Scripture says, that He gives unconditionally for the highest good of the loved object. He's truthful. He's in perfect agreement with himself. He never contradicts himself. He is sovereign. He is the supreme ruler over all. He's holy. He's absolutely perfect. He's just. He treats all creation fairly. He's omnipresent. You can't go anywhere in the universe where he is not. He is omniscient. He's all-knowing. He knows everything, good, bad, past, present, future. It's all the same to him. He knows it all. He is omnipotent. Uh, In the Old Testament, one of his names is El Shaddai, God Almighty. He's able to do anything he deems necessary to do. He is eternal. He's not limited by time. He's infinite. There are no limitations on any of these attributes. He is unchangeable. That means he can't alter his basic character. You know, we as human beings, are we fluctuate. We're up and down, mood-wise, temperament, uh, behaviorally. We're all over the map. God is always the same. Uh, He's always the same. So when we look at these attributes, we're looking at God in a sense like we would look at a multifaceted diamond. There's no one attribute that overrules the others or that doesn't intersect the others. They all cooperate with one another there, this again, just like a multifaceted diamond. So when we take out an attribute and we're looking at it, in a sense, that's an artificial thing because love connects with omnipresence. Love connects with truth. Sovereignty connects with holiness and so forth. All these attributes of God fit together to form what we know about God. So I'm excited. I'm really looking forward to delving into each of these attributes. And I hope you are too. And I'll be praying with you uh, that the Holy Spirit would work in me and you so that we can better know Him. 
And then in line with what Zach and Mark have been talking about in recent weeks about praying God down, this is it. I mean, we're praying that God would show himself to us in his word, in his work, that we would come away uh, better acquainted with him, more knowledgeable about who he is, not just in our heads, but in our hearts, so that we would have experiential uh, connection with God that influences everything we do in this life. You know, again, I've been around for a while now. I'm 70 years old. And I've been a Christian since 1967, as I previously mentioned. Here's an observation I've made as a counselor, as a pastoral staff member in, in past years. People who know God can maintain a sense of stability in their lives that the world cannot comprehend in the face of severe persecution, difficulties, crises, losses, God is that stable factor that sees them through. Again, in a sense, every problem known to man, if we will apply an attribute of God to it, what we know about God to that, and entrust it to him in his care, it's the ultimate solution to that problem. I'll close with this verse. Daniel 11.32 The people who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Shall be strong and do exploits. That's my prayer for you. That's my prayer for myself as we engage in this study. Let's pray. Father, I pray for your Holy Spirit to be active among us, to open our eyes to seeing you more clearly. I pray that it would have a profound effect, not on our intellects only, but on our hearts, that we would be changed people as a result of your Spirit's work in us. In Christ's name, amen.